I'm 22 now, but this happened when I was 16. At the time, I lived in Staten Island, New York. For a little background, I'm a female, and at the time, I was 120 pounds soaking wet, with a height of 5'6". I thought I was invincible. I never imagined anything like this would have ever happened to me. It was March 17th of 2013, around 10.30 p.m. I was leaving my boyfriend's house. He walked me to the local bus stop as he always did. We joked and laughed while we waited for my bus to show up. Because it was kind of late, there weren't many cars on the street. I happened to notice a black SUV parked across the road. I didn't think much of it at the time. My bus eventually showed up and I said goodbye to my boyfriend and I boarded. I took a seat next to the bus driver. The rest of the bus was completely empty. The driver turned to me once we hit the first red light and then he asked, What are you doing out this late? It was random and a bit creepy. I replied with, I was just hanging out with my boyfriend. We made small talk and my initial apprehension was put at ease. The driver then told me that it wasn't exactly safe to be out and about at this hour and that I should be more careful. I nodded, but as I said before, that was an arrogant 16-year-old who thought she was invincible. As my stop approached, I looked at my phone. The time read 11.30 p.m. My phone's battery was down to 5%. Oh, that's great, I thought to myself as I exited the bus and said my goodbyes to the driver. He told me to stay safe, and I gave him another nod as the door folded back shut. For some reason, I just stood there and watched the bus make its way down the street until its taillights were well out of sight. As I stood there at the empty stop, a sensation of what I can only describe as impending doom came over me. I made my way to the bench to sit down. The bus that dropped me off near my house was scheduled to arrive at 11.40. Only 10 minutes. As I sat there staring off into space, thinking about some things I had to do when I got home, a black SUV pulls up to the bus stop. The uneasy feeling I had earlier intensified. But I did my best to play it cool. The man rolls down his window and asks me, Hey, excuse me, do you know what time the bus is supposed to be here? He appeared to be a mix between Spanish and Asian, and had a medium build. At this point, I did not make the connection that this may have been the same vehicle I saw just before I boarded the first bus. I figured that he was probably just waiting for somebody, so I replied, It shouldn't be long. He then asked me how long I had been waiting. It was then that I started to get a little freaked out. This guy was giving me the creeps. But I considered that I might be just overreacting. Perhaps he was just trying to pass the time. But still, I kept my guard up. I answered that I hadn't been waiting long. He then proceeded to try to make more small talk. I was trying to be polite. But I also kept looking at my pitch black phone screen, trying to subtly hint to him that I wasn't interested in conversation. It was dark out by this point. The only luminescence was coming from some distant street lights. However, there were also two big trees outside the bus stop that were positioned in such a way that they blocked out most of the light. So if this guy tried anything, the dark would have provided decent cover. I nervously clenched my phone, the uncomfortable feeling inside increasing with every passing second. He then told me that he was new to the area and didn't know his way around too well. He claimed that he was in the army and was stationed nearby. He then asked me where the beach was. It's just down the street. I told him in a very matter-of-fact way, as if to convey, maybe you should go there so I don't have to look at you anymore. It was then that our eyes met. I could see his face very clearly. His eyes were not like any normal human's eyes. It was as if they were looking right through me, staring at me like a hungry fox who just discovered a trapped, defenseless rabbit. He then asked me, Do you mind if you show me around? Come on, get in the car for a little while. I may have been a naive 16-year-old, but I was not an idiot. I knew that if I got in that car, that would be the last time anyone ever heard from me. 
I was trying my best to show him that I wasn't afraid, so I politely declined while looking down the street for my bus. He then began to beg and plead. It was really kind of pathetic. I told him no once again. He then said something that I will never forget. Come on, baby. It won't take long. I promise. At that moment, my blood ran cold, and my stomach felt like it was going to drop right out of my ass. I felt absolutely sick, like I was going to throw up. But I kept my cool, and thankfully my bus was now in sight and coming down the street. A feeling of relief washed over me. I told him no once again, thinking that would be the end of it. He then told me that he would drive me home right afterward. This guy would not give up, and I finally had enough. With all the strength and courage in me, I shouted, No, leave me the hell alone, you fucking loser! As my bus pulled up, I heard him say something genuinely terrifying. And I quote, Fine, bitch, I'll just follow you and see where you live. My heart started to race. My hands broke out in a cold sweat, and my body began to tremble with fear. I quickly got on the bus, and honestly, I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver. I think I was just in a state of shock, and was hoping that Mr. Jailbait Hunter in the SUV didn't mean what he said, and that he was just pissed off and trying to scare me. When I sat down and looked out of the window, I saw the headlights of the SUV. They were tailing the bus. I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. When the bus arrived at my stop, I ran like hell. I reached the front door of my house, which was usually unlocked, but tonight, of all nights, it was locked from top to bottom. I frantically rang the doorbell while going through my bag to find my keys. I then heard someone pull up out front. Without turning around, I knew who it was. Just like in the movies, I dropped the keys as I was trying to put them in the front door. I finally managed to unlock my front door. Before turning the handle, I heard a car door slam shut from behind me. I quickly ran inside and slammed the door shut. In a panic, I explained to my mother and my older brother what happened. My brother ran outside and looked up and down the street. I was shaking, absolutely consumed by terror. My emotions finally got the best of me, and I could no longer hold back my tears. We called the police, and they came and searched the area. They asked me if I had gotten a tag number, and unfortunately, I had to tell the officers that it was too dark to see. But I did notice a sticker of some sort of bird on the backseat driver's side window. It didn't dawn on me until they left that this had been the same SUV that was across the street when I was with my boyfriend an hour prior. They told me that they checked the army base nearby and the surrounding area, but nobody had seen any vehicle matching the description I gave. All I could think about was what the bus driver had said to me and the irony of what took place that same night. Years went by, and I didn't think much about this incident after that night. One day, I was scrolling through Facebook when I came across a picture my friend had posted. It was a story of a man who had been following her home from work for the past three days, and it was the same guy who I encountered five years prior. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my throat. Looking at the post, I noticed that several other women had come forward, and they all shared similar experiences to mine. I ended up finding out that he almost kidnapped a 13-year-old girl, she allowed herself to be lured into his car, but once inside, she noticed a roll of duct tape, some rope, a pair of gloves, and a bottle of what turned out to be chloroform on the floorboard. She ended up jumping out of the window while they were stopped at a red light. I don't know all the details, but apparently he got physical with another woman, who was pregnant, and tried to force her into his car. He got pretty ballsy and started trying to abduct women in broad daylight. The news found out that his name was Leo, and it was also discovered that he had a wife and two daughters, who were around three and five. They interviewed his neighbors, and to my surprise, they defended him, saying that all these women were just lying. It's truly unbelievable how stupid people are. Five separate accounts from five different women who have no connection with each other have come forward and shared their experiences. 
Could you please dislodge your head from your ass and face up to the facts? Anyway, to this day, I have no idea whatever became of him. The last I heard, he was still at large. I hope they caught him, so no other young women have to be subjected to this monster ever again. To start things off, I am a 26-year-old female, and I'm also quite petite, which makes me appear a lot younger than I really am. I am a New Hampshire resident, and I live a rather short distance away from a state hospital known as Concord. I used to work in the Steeplegate Mall, which unfortunately has been dying due to the lack of foot traffic, so naturally many stores ended up shutting down. Because of that, the mall has become more of a dead zone by the day, making it a hotspot for shady people. There have been many times where I've cashed out people who were clearly under the influence of heavy drugs. I'm not sure if it was heroin or whatever, but you could just tell by looking at these people and trying to communicate with them that they just weren't all there. Some of these customers would even walk in bleeding without even knowing it. Now that you understand the details, let's get into the story. One night, me and my friend, who I'll refer to as Tony, decided to take an Uber into town. I was feeling a bit down over some drama that was happening in my personal life, so Tony wanted to cheer me up and get me out of the house for a bit. We were having a great time going into the stores and getting in our exercise. The mall would be closing soon, so we decided to take advantage of my discount and grab something to eat. We exited the mall and it was about 8 p.m., so it was pretty dark outside. The parking lot was mostly empty aside from a few cars. We were making our way to the art store when we suddenly saw a white car drop someone off. This person appeared to be male, but we couldn't quite see his face and he soon disappeared into the bushes. Tony was keeping an eye on the man while I was watching the driver peel out of the parking lot. We both thought that was the end of the white car, but less than a minute later, the car came back, attempting to get closer to us. He would peel out on the pavement, getting more and more aggressive the closer he got. Tony and I were both beyond scared by this point. It felt as if my heart was about to pop out of my throat, and Tony looked like she was in utter shock or disbelief. I quickly started looking around for a place that we could possibly hide and I saw the back door to a bonton that went out of business and suggested to Tony that we should make a break for that door. Our legs were sore from all the walking we had done that day, but the primal fear that we were both feeling propelled us forward, and we booked it through the back door, figuring that it would at least buy us some time, and we could call for help. However, we entered a small room that had another door that led into the main area, and that door was locked preventing us from going any further. We pulled out our phones, and my heart sank once I realized that my phone was dead, and Tony's phone was glitching so bad that it was unusable. She was struggling with her phone, and we both heard the car slowly drive by the door. I immediately felt my stomach drop, and I thought that this was the end. This psychopath was going to kidnap me and my friend, and this is how we would die. Luckily, the driver lost interest and drove off. It took a lot of courage for us just to open the door and leave. After multiple attempts of restarting her phone, Tony was finally able to get it to work. She then called up an Uber to drive us home. The next day, I brought this up to my boss, and she told me there had been a lot of suspicious people coming through that end of the mall, where a charter school was located. Apparently, some sketchy individuals have been spying on children and that mall security would be patrolling that area more thoroughly. Tony and I are now convinced that this person may have thought we were kids that attended the school. In early September, the store that I worked at ended up closing, and not even a month after I stopped working there, there was a shooting in the mall parking lot. It was ruled as a murder-suicide. A woman was shot by her boyfriend, and then he turned the gun on himself. He was found dead on the scene and the woman was taken to the hospital, where she later succumbed to her injuries. After being harassed in the parking lot that night, and now hearing about the shooting, 
Let's just say that Tony and I will be staying far away from that area from now on. Clearly, it's not a very safe place to be. We both learned a valuable lesson that night. Never walk through a parking lot in spots where most people can't see you, especially at night. And always make sure your phone is charged, because you never know when you might need it. This happened about five or six years ago. I was in my mid-twenties, and I lived in a small town with access to a lake, which made it a popular spot for tourists from the northern suburbs of Chicago. It was early in the fall, so tourist season was winding down, and things were starting to return to a more quiet, if not somewhat boring, pace. I was off of work that day, and I decided to get out and enjoy some fresh air. For me, this often meant sitting on a park bench and watching the lake and all of its comings and goings for a while before getting up to walk down the lakefront and over to the beach house. I slowly wandered across the park and over to this old wooden bench that went over a creek that fed into the lake. This led to a small sidewalk that extended to a side access road. People like to set up lawn chairs and sit in the grass in this area. There was also this large tree that had to have been there for a century or more that served as a natural rally point. I was approaching that tree when I stopped to take in the view. It was at this point that I realized that I had left my phone at home. There were no chairs up that day, and I was the only one on the sidewalk. Traffic on the main road had been pretty light, and there was only one car parked on the access road. It was a perfect day, but as I stood there, I heard the unmistakable sound of a car slowly pulling up behind me. I didn't think anything of it at first. I was fully expecting the vehicle to pass me and pull up into one of the parking spots. However, it didn't. My next thought was that my dad may have come down to see what I was up to. He also liked to hang out at the same park like I did, but when I didn't hear the familiar greeting, I started to pay closer attention. I always look like I'm totally lost in thought when I'm out there, but I actually do keep a pretty good eye on my surroundings and the idling vehicle behind me was putting me on edge. Once in a while people stop at odd spots to snap pictures of the lake, but I got the feeling that it wasn't the lake that was being watched, it was me. I peered over my shoulder and saw a red Ford Windstar minivan sitting there. The windows were tinted, but I can make out that there was a man sitting in the driver's seat, and he was looking right at me. But the one thing that got me the most was the sight of the front license plate. It read, and I kid you not, Skinner. I gave this van a good once over to let the driver know that I saw him. I also did my best to make my posture seem like I wasn't nervous, that I was alert. I decided to move a bit further down the sidewalk, like I wasn't unsettled by Mr. Skinner and his minivan. I stopped again when I heard the sound of his tires rolling over the pavement. He was following me, doing his best to keep at about 10 feet away. I started going over what-if scenarios in my head. I could see a creep wanting to hang around and stalk me if I was a attractive woman or something, but I'm a fat guy of average height, so I never considered that I would be the target of an abduction. I glanced around again, and I saw no one else walking down the sidewalk. It was just me and the van. I decided to walk off the concrete and into the grass like I was going to stand by the water. I made my way around that big tree and stood out of sight. I started listening for the van doors, but all I heard was the sound of the engine idling. The driver wasn't getting out, but he wasn't leaving either. I began wondering how long he would sit there and wait, so I stayed out of sight for a good 10 minutes hoping that he would get bored. Finally, I saw a figure coming from the direction of the beach. It was an old man, maybe in his late 70s. I reached into my pocket where I kept a knife. I figured this old guy was going to be my ticket to break this waiting game with Mr. Skinner. He was either going to make his move, in which case I would be ready, or he was going to bug out because we weren't alone anymore. As the old man got closer, I could tell that he was eyeing me and the minivan. 
I came out from around the tree and back into Skinner's view and began walking toward the old man. My hand was still in my pocket as I approached him. He looked a little unsure of me. I made a big show of being very friendly with him. I contemplated telling the old guy that the van was following me and to call the police when he got to a phone, but I decided not to. When we finally got within a few feet of each other, we struck up a conversation. As I started commenting on how it was a great day for a walk, I heard the minivan move again. It crept past us back onto the main road and drove away. The old man half turned to watch it, and after it was gone, he made mention that the guy was just sitting there staring at me. I laughed a bit and told him that was why I was behind the tree. After the old man went on his way, I milled around that part of the sidewalk for about five minutes, trying to figure out what the guy in the minivan wanted and why he had chosen that for a license plate. I happened to look back towards the park, and just beyond that was my car. I had parked just off the main intersection because the park was right there. I thought about turning around and heading back, calling it quits and moving on from the strange ordeal, and that's when I saw him. The Red Windstar was turning on to the main east-west street and was heading my way again. I took out my knife and quickly flipped open the blade and started picking out my thumbnail with it. He missed the turn to get back onto the side road, but he slowed way down as he passed. He stared straight at me the entire time, and this time I made sure he saw that I had a knife in my hand. Once he passed by, he accelerated and vanished in the same direction that he had gone the first time. I was pretty confident that he would make a third pass, and if I was still in the open and alone, he would come back and we would have another weird standoff. Whatever he was up to, this time I wasn't going to be in the open for him. If he really wanted me, he would have to come looking. I walked further down by the beach. There was a lot of tree cover there. There were a few cubbies for people to sit in and watch the beach. So I camped out in one and waited for the van. I figured that he wasn't coming back after about a half hour, and at this point, I just wanted to go home. I walked back the way I had come from, keeping a watchful eye out for Mr. Skinner, who I'm glad to say, never did make his return. To this day, I have no idea what the guy wanted. His plates were Wisconsin plates, but I had never seen that van before, and I asked around town, and no one else could recall a van of that same make and model with that particular license plate. I still think about it from time to time. I often wonder what would have happened if he had gotten out of his van. I always envisioned that he had a syringe or something, and that he would have stuck it into my arm and knocked me out, and from there, I don't know. Thinking about this incident is always followed by the hope that he hasn't done this to someone else. After all, Wisconsin is the state that gave us Ed Gein and Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm just thankful that old man walked up when he did, so I didn't have to find out what Mr. Skinner's real motives were. This took place in my hometown of Weymouth when I was 14. My friends and I decided to go exploring in an abandoned building that was next to some railroad tracks. We figured that we could sneak in through a loading bay that faced the tracks. Our plan was to sneak out at 11 p.m., get there by 11.30, and try and be back at our houses by 1. I will admit that I was scared in the days leading up to it. It was basically unheard of in my town for anyone to do anything remotely risky. But we were young and reckless. We wanted excitement and adventure. The night came and Tim and Charlie were supposed to meet me by a streetlight near a cafe. And then we would find the tracks and follow them for about a quarter mile until we got to the loading bay. I grabbed a couple of flashlights and headed out my door when my family finally fell asleep. As I was walking down to the cafe, I heard footsteps approaching quickly from behind me. When I turned around, no one was there. I ignored it thinking that my mind was playing tricks on me. After about five minutes, it happened again. Again, I turned around, and there was nothing. I finally got to the cafe where we were supposed to meet. 
My friends Tim and Charlie were already there, so we proceeded with our plan. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I wasn't about to let my friends know that I was scared. We finally reached the abandoned building. One of the old rusty bay doors was jammed open, just enough for us to slide under it. We entered the building and turned on our flashlights. There was graffiti everywhere. It was obvious that we weren't the only ones that came in here looking for thrills. There was one piece of graffiti that caught my eye. It was a metallic paint that stood out from the rest. It read, Don't come back. Hey guys, come check this out. I called out to my friends. I was answered by manic footsteps pounding behind me. I turned, and I saw a tall, skinny man with greasy, wiry hair. He wore horribly ripped clothes. His eyes were wide open, with a huge ear-to-ear -ear smile. I was frozen to the spot, utterly paralyzed by fear. He threw his head back and cackled, and I just stood there in complete horror and shock until my friends started screaming at me to run. That brought me back to reality, and I booked it. As I was approaching the bay door, I still heard the man's footsteps behind me. They were getting louder, and he was closing in. I slid through the door like a baseball player, and as soon as I scrambled to my feet, we made a break for it. But the thing that stuck with me, even to this day, the thing that still chills me to the bone, was the voice that boomed out from the building. Don't come back. That only made us run faster. What the hell was that? Tim panted as we ran. I don't know, I said. Charlie was so shaken up that he did not say a single word. When we got back to the cafe, we decided that we would all go back to our houses. But there was one thought that kept me up for the rest of the night. One thought that still haunts me to this day. How long had he been following me that night? I'm a female and a freshman in college, attending a local university in my area. I decided to live on campus to get the full college experience, not wanting to miss out on fun opportunities my college had to offer. Starting in a new school already made me nervous, but the idea of being on my own in college made it all the more scary. I've never not had anyone before, being a twin and all, so I've had a built-in best friend pretty much my whole life. My twin, however, went off to a different college, and I was alone. The semester started off like I anticipated. My classes were full of quiet, anxious kids like myself, who also didn't know what to expect. There was one kid in my morning history class who put me off. He always wore a dirty baseball cap, cargo pants, and a tattered long t-shirt. He had a chubby face, but wasn't extremely overweight, but at the same time, he wasn't fit. He had narrow glasses and talked obnoxiously about the most random things to anyone and everyone. He exhibited very strange behavior. I didn't think too much about him as he sat pretty far away from me. I didn't think he would ever bother me. That was until next class came. Our history class had finished up and I was packing my stuff up to leave. I hadn't noticed that this strange guy had come over to my desk until I looked up and saw him hovering over me. I put on a weak smile as I waited for him to say something. Hi, I'm Connor, he said quietly in a monotone voice. I almost couldn't hear him. Hi, nice to meet you. Connor didn't say anything else. I thought it was weird, but again, I didn't think much of it. It seemed like a harmless little encounter. That was until our next history class together. Everything went well during the class. I felt fine, and Connor sat in his seat far away from me. As class was dismissed, and everyone was packing up their belongings to leave, I was the last one out as I had to put my reading glasses away and into my backpack. When I looked up at the door, Connor was there waiting for me. He didn't say anything. He just stood at the door watching me. I was very confused as we've never talked before 
and he was just standing there giving me this creepy look, watching me pack the rest of my things away. I walked out of the door and he followed me. He casually mentioned the test we had taken that day, trying to brag to me about it, making himself seem above me in a way. I got a 91 on the test today. No big deal. What about you? 85? I responded. It was so easy though. His response was very patronizing, and I didn't like it one bit. People who brag always tend to make me mad, and he seemed like one of those types of people. At some point down the stairs, it was a long way down because we were on the fourth floor, he started talking about sweatpants for some reason. He was mumbling so much that I couldn't even hear what he was saying, and to be honest, I was trying to get away from him. I suddenly looked back at him, and he was holding a condom up to my face. I think you know what I'm talking about, Connor randomly said while giving me a creepy smile. I awkwardly nodded my head, trying to stay collected as we reached the bottom of the stairs. Whatever he had mumbled under his breath couldn't have been good or anything I wanted to talk about with him. When we got outside, he said, Well, that stuff is awkward to talk about. I wanted to ask why he brought it up to begin with, but I kept to myself and tried to get the hell away from him. I hadn't felt that uncomfortable in a while, and this guy was just giving me the creeps. But I'm not a very confrontational person, and I hate to upset anyone in general. Connor then asked me to a homecoming dance that was being facilitated by a student organization on campus. When I told him that I would be visiting my parents on the day that the dance was supposed to take place, his response unnerved me. Well, I'm not going to stop you from visiting your parents. After that, I started exercising extreme caution around him. I didn't trust him. Not one bit. That may seem obvious, but I'm telling you, you would not want to be alone in a dark alley with this guy. He was really giving off Brock Allen Turner type vibes. So some time passes, and I'm in history class again. That day we were taking a test. He finished his around 8.20. I saw him walk out of the classroom, and I was a bit relieved. I finished up my test around 9.05. I looked at my text messages before exiting the classroom. One of my friends in that class had texted me. I think Connor is waiting for you. My heart started to beat really fast. There was no way he could be waiting for me. He would have had to have been waiting for 45 minutes. I peeked around the door to look into the waiting area outside of the room. And sure enough, there was Connor, sitting there on his phone, waiting. At this point, I became really scared and confused. Why would he be waiting for me? We were not friends, and I never even hinted at the idea that I would ever be interested in him. I begrudgingly exited the class, and sure enough he followed me down the stairs yet again, talking about a whole bunch of weird, creepy stuff that I didn't really care much to listen to. Something else that I had been noticing was that he seemed to be moving closer and closer to my desk each class. Turning around and looking at me constantly, it made me feel so uncomfortable, and I would give him this stare that pretty much said, what the hell are you looking at? showing him that I saw what he was doing. But he didn't seem to care. He continued to follow me until I pretty much ran away. There was another incident where I was walking into the history building, and Connor was in mid-conversation with this girl from my class. He immediately stopped talking to her and followed me up into the classroom. The creepiest part about all this is that it's still going on. I only have two months left with him in my class for this semester. I have tried to raise this issue with the school's administration, and they told me that unless he threatens me, or touches me, there wouldn't be anything that they could do. I don't know how much longer I could take this. I have to look over my shoulder every time I go to school. If things get worse, and he becomes more daring with his behavior, who knows what he could do next. Growing up, I lived in a heavily forested area. There's this now abandoned house that was in the woods behind my childhood home. 
The driveway connected to ours and broke off and circled around our garage and went deeper into the trees. It was a single-story house with a nice big front porch and had an outdoor overhang instead of a full garage. When I was a kid, we had an elderly neighbor who lived back there named Mr. Fisher. He was a Vietnam vet who was partially blind in one eye. He normally wore glasses or an eye patch on the rare occasions that we would see him outside. He kept to himself mostly and never really had any visitors. It was about 20 years ago, back when I was in high school. I was home alone playing on my Nintendo. I remember that it was later in the day and it was raining pretty hard. I was grounded for some reason that I can't remember and I was bitterly sitting in my room taking out my teenage frustrations on the game and that's when I heard screaming from behind my house. I paused my game, cracked open my window, and listened. Every few moments I would hear a faint screaming coming from Mr. Fisher's house, maybe 50 or so yards away from my own. I couldn't figure out if it was an angry scream or a terrified one, but I remember just sitting there for a few moments and listening to it, more curious than alarmed. After a few minutes I got bored and shut the window and returned to my video game. I don't know why I didn't call for help or run over and knock on Mr. Fisher's door to see if things were okay. My only explanation was that I was a bitter teenager and I didn't want to be bothered with anything that wasn't my business. Later that night after my parents came home, I was lying in bed when I once again heard the muffled screaming coming from behind the house. This time I could tell it was labored and ragged, and I can remember being annoyed, wishing that whoever it was would just shut up already. I didn't even mention it to my parents the next morning. So about a week goes by, and I have completely forgotten about the screaming I heard that night. I was outside throwing the football with my father, when the mailman stopped his truck and asked us if we had seen Mr. Fisher. Apparently he had not been collecting his mail. My father replied that he hadn't seen his car for a few days, and I remained silent. The mailman and my father walked down the driveway and knocked on Mr. Fisher's door. The next thing I remember were the sirens. An ambulance, a fire engine, and several police cars arrived. I spent most of that afternoon up in a tree, watching Mr. Fisher's house as law enforcement and paramedics went in and out. My father had found Mr. Fisher's front door unlocked. He had been lying in a crumpled heap at the bottom of his basement stairs. It appears that he had fallen and broken both of his legs, but it wasn't the fall that killed him. It was the rats. My father eventually told me that the coroner reported the man had been eaten alive while he was screaming for help, unable to climb back upstairs. He had defensive wounds all over his hands from swatting at them, and several dead rats were scattered around, but in the end, there had been too many of them to fight off. His face had sustained the worst damage. There was almost nothing left of it when they found him. The coroners were convinced that he had been alive through the worst of it. I felt as though I had been stabbed in the stomach and a wave of traumatizing guilt washed over me and I broke down in tears. I still didn't tell my parents, but on the inside I was mortified. I felt like a criminal for ignoring those screams. And for weeks after that I was convinced that the police were going to come back and arrest me for negligence or something. For about a year afterwards, it traumatized me, and I carried the guilt around in secret. I started doing drugs and drinking alcohol to try to dull the pain. In a retrospect, I'm extremely lucky I graduated high school without overdosing, or killing someone while being drunk behind the wheel. I was about 20 years old when myself and three of my friends went back to the house in late October. The house had been repossessed by the bank at this point and now sat condemned. Me and my friends sat on the front porch and shared a bottle of bourbon. My family almost considered this vacant house our second home since it was so close to our property. My father would even do some yard work every once in a while and make sure nothing was growing on the house. 
So like I said, my friends and I were drinking and smoking, and being belligerent idiots. Just talking shit and lying about girls that we had slept with. I got up and went around the back of the house to take a piss. I happened to crouch down and glance inside one of those low-to-the-ground basement windows and just scanned the basement floor. All I could really see was a cracked cement floor and loads of cobwebs crisscrossing the window. I took care of business and was about to walk back around front when I paused. Glancing back towards the window, I felt a sudden sensation that I was being examined. This time, there was something in the window that hadn't been there before. Very clearly, I could see the outline of an old bearded face and a single eye staring up at me. Kind of at an angle, as if someone was lifting themselves up to peer out the window. I stared back, my body going numb and my mind going blank. I suppose that this is the part in horror stories where the people would say, I felt a chill go down my spine, or my blood ran cold. I didn't feel that way. I just went numb as I looked back at the figure in the window, the unmistakable feeling of being caught in an act washing over me, like I had been vandalizing the place or something. I believe the eye contact lasted for about 10 seconds, maybe slightly more, and I eventually just turned around and walked away. When I got to the front porch, I told my friends I was heading back to my garage. For a few short hours, I was convinced that it had been either a squatter or maybe my imagination. But that night, I had the most horrific nightmare. I was trapped in a dark room with rats crawling all over me and gnawing at my face as I lay helpless. I woke up the next morning feeling sick. What bothered me the most was that whatever I had seen in the basement window, there had only been one eye visible, just like when I remember my old neighbor. It wasn't until I was about 30 years old that I had made peace with the fact that I had seen the man's spirit. He had been staring back at me in distress and confusion, wondering why I hadn't helped him. I have read several books on the paranormal, and I came to the conclusion that his spirit wasn't yet at peace. My parents eventually sold that house to me, and today I only use it as a summer home. But I've never wandered back to the old man's property again. Several times he's made his presence known. A few years ago I was jump-starting my car outside in the driveway, when suddenly four rats shot out from under the axle, between my legs, and scurried away towards Mr. Fisher's old home. Last year there was a soft knock on my window as I sat in my living room. And only a few months ago, I was awoken from a deep sleep because I thought I could hear screaming from outside. My biggest fear now that I'm an adult is being alone and in pain and having no one to come and aid me as I scream for help. I guess this is my way of finally getting it off my chest. When I go back there this summer, I plan on returning to Mr. Fisher's house. I will try my best to apologize to him and I can only hope that this will finally put his spirit at rest. I was 19 at the time of this story. I was living in Littleton, Colorado at the time. For the brief amount of time that I lived there, I had many crazy situations that happened. For now, I will tell you about one in particular. It will help to know what I looked like so you can better understand why this may have happened to me. As I said, I was 19 at the time. I stood at 5'7", 130 pounds. I had wildly colored hair, bright red, several facial piercings, and arm and chest tattoos. It was a warm day, so I was wearing very comfortable clothes, shorts and a tank top, along with a pair of flip-flops and a sun hat. Because of the previous encounters that I've had, I stopped taking night walks. That day, I let my boyfriend take my truck to work, since I didn't have to work that day and I had no plans. But I wanted to surprise him at work and take him to dinner after he got off. So I started walking up Broadway towards Colfax. Now, if you've ever lived in the Denver area for any amount of time, people will generally warn you about Colfax Avenue. It's busy, and some sketchy activity takes place on that street. But for some reason, my oh-so-awesome roommates did not warn me of the many horrors that awaited me on Colfax Avenue. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit dramatic, but my experience was not pleasant. 
So back to the story. I turned from Broadway onto Colfax. As soon as I turned, it was like stepping into another world. There was a bus stop. I'm pretty sure I saw some guy taking bumps pressed up against the nearest building. Several homeless people were laying and sitting in various places up the street. Two women were screaming at each other about something that I didn't care to gather. I walked quickly for two or three blocks with my heart in my throat. I am not cut out for this sort of social interaction. I accidentally made eye contact with a dirty man lurking in an alleyway. I quickly averted my eyes to my flip-flops and kept walking. After a few blocks, the crowd thinned, and I was feeling less on edge. In fact, I was actually starting to enjoy my walk. But then I noticed this van. It was parked across the street, trying to look inconspicuous. I saw the driver slide down in his seat, as if he was trying to avoid being seen. I couldn't make out the details, but I could see that he was an older man with a dark complexion and short black hair. Trying not to stare for too long, I committed this creeper van to my memory. It was white, with tinted windows, no company markings and no front driver's license plate. Red flags were going off in my head, but I pushed away the feeling. I walked another block or two, and I see this same van creeping up a side street. I get a nervous chill, though I press on, trying my best not to look frightened. After another couple of blocks, I see this van again. I didn't like where this situation was heading, so I stood my ground and faced the van, staring straight into the man's face and waiting for his reaction to me noticing him. To my horror, he gets out of the van, slamming the door behind him. He was a short Hispanic man, I would say 5'4", about 150 pounds, shorter than me, but definitely bigger. My mind is racing as he runs across the road towards me. I am frozen to the spot. I wasn't expecting this. As soon as he reaches me, he starts speaking in broken English, but I can mostly understand him. He compliments me. He says he likes my hair, piercings, freckles, and my ass. Oh, joy. Extremely uncomfortable by this point, I awkwardly thanked him. He then propositioned me for sex. I nearly choked and asked him to repeat himself. Not sure if I was hearing him correctly. But he pulled out $200 from his wallet and offered it to me if I would have sex with him. I take a step back harshly telling him that I'm not that kind of girl, and he's barking up the wrong tree. I turn around, and as I did, he grabs my ass. I then speed walk away from this man, trying my best not to panic and formulate a plan. The man follows me, waving the $200 around like it would convince me to go back. I run to the first door I see and yank it open. As soon as I rush in, I run directly into a bouncer. I then fall back on my ass with a yelp. The bouncer helps me up and asks me why I was in such a hurry. I'm still in shock at this point, and he asks me to see my ID. I look around and I realize that I'm in a pub. I then tell him on the verge of tears that I'm only 19, and I was trying to hide from a man who was following me outside. I'm practically having a panic attack as the bouncer guides me to the bar and fetches me a glass of water. The bouncer wanted a description of the man. He tells me to hang tight and disappears out the door. After a few long minutes, he returns and tells me that the man won't be a problem anymore, but I am still reasonably frightened. The bouncer then asked me where I was heading. I checked the GPS on my phone, and I was only two blocks away from my boyfriend's job. The bouncer then clocks out on his break and offers to walk me the remaining two blocks. I beamed and latched on to the man's arm thanking him profusely. He pats my head and laughs, and he told me never to walk down Colfax Avenue alone again, and I promised him that I would not repeat this mistake. When we arrived at my boyfriend's job, I thanked the bouncer again and sent him on his way. I explained what happened to my boyfriend, and he laughed at me. Perhaps I deserve that, but no one had warned me of the dangers of that road. I ended up not taking him to dinner that night, and I never walked that street alone again. So, to the man in the creeper van, 
stay the fuck away from me and keep your 200 for something less creepy. Before I begin, I would like to preface by stating that I'm a 23-year-old female and I currently attend a graduate school in the Midwest. Earlier this year, I attended a research conference in New Orleans with four other grad students in my academic program. In order to save money, all of us decided to rent out an Airbnb for the duration of the conference instead of staying at a hotel. We ended up finding a really nice studio apartment about a mile away from downtown New Orleans. The apartment was rather small and contained two queen-size beds as well as a futon. Our party was four girls and one guy. I shared one of the beds with my friend Anna, and the two other girls, Megan and Caddy, shared the other bed. The other student, Ari, ended up having the futon all to himself. We decided to hit up downtown New Orleans shortly after unpacking and settling into the Airbnb. After exploring the area and hitting up a few bars, we decided to head back and call in a night, as we had to be present at the conference early the next morning. All of us hit the sack shortly after returning back to the Airbnb. I woke up a couple of hours later to a creaking sound. At first, I thought it was nothing, but then I saw the apartment door slowly open and a man in a black hoodie came inside. I allowed the panic to set in and I immediately woke up Anna. When she was awake, I pointed out the man. He was slowly walking towards us. Anna asked me, Who is that? I, I don't know. I responded. She got out of bed to get a better look at the guy. Can we help you? The man just stood there in silence. He then made his way over to Megan and Caddy's bed, who were both fast asleep. He then proceeded to climb on top of them. My heart was now racing faster than ever but I couldn't move as I was paralyzed in fear. Ari, why are you in our bed? I heard Caddy groan. Then Megan woke up and yelled, Ari, what the fuck are you doing? Get out of our bed! Megan, that's not Ari. I said in a trembling voice. Ari was still asleep on the futon despite all of the commotion. The man was basically on top of Megan and Caddy, who were screaming hysterically at this point and desperately trying to get him off. I told Anna to wake Ari up, and she immediately ran over to him and started shaking him. I heard her say, Ari, wake up! There's a man in Caddy and Megan's bed right now! You need to help us! What? That's... crazy. Ari said, still half asleep. I got out of the bed and grabbed my phone. I immediately called 911, and I told the operator to send help as soon as possible. While I was on the phone, I saw Ari get up and turn on the light. He ran over and pulled the man off of Caddy and Megan. Get the fuck off them! Ari yelled and threw the man to the ground. I managed to get a better look at the intruder once the lights were on. He was bald and had a very thick beard. He was also missing several teeth. He began to laugh hysterically once he was on the ground. Megan and Caddy both huddled together in the corner of the apartment while Anna stood behind Ari. We were all very frightened. Once the police arrived, they gathered all of our information and escorted the man out of the apartment. Needless to say, the frightening and traumatic experience pretty much ruined our stay in New Orleans. I still have nightmares about the man to this day. Please be sure to keep your doors locked. You never know who might want to stop by for a nightly visit. There's always a reason to be afraid.